I thought I would talk today about uh, some uh, updates on the on the Lahar detection system work here at CVO, and this is uh, basically work in work in progress. Here is um, Mount Rainier in the background of the picture. The foreground is the port of Tacoma, which is the mouth of the Puyallup River. Now the Puyallup drains the west flank of Mount Rainier. This is the Lahar hazard map of Rainier. This is where the picture in the previous slide was taken from, looking southeast towards Mount Rainier up the Puyallup River Valley. The other valleys on, on uh, Rainier are also Laharogenic. We've got the Nisqually, Cowlitz, the White River, and the Carbon River. The Carbon River flows into the Puyallup River at uh, about the town of Ording. This is Ording right here, and it sits on a, la on a layer of um, uh, Lahar, or Rainier's Lahar and flood deposits, among which are a, uh, uh, is the, is the uh, electron. So there have been a number of eruption related Lahars at Mount Rainier in the last 10,000 years, but the electron 500 years ago which had a volume of maybe 250 million cubic meters, left about three meters of material here at Ording. The problem with the electron was it appears to have been sourced from a landslide up here on the, on the upper west flank of Mount Rainier, unassociated with any, any uh, volcanic activity. So there's a, there's a possibility that this would have had no precursors. This is a, uh, on the left is a, is a slope uh, stability map done by Mark Reed of the summit area of Mount Rainier. And this red zone is the summit sunset amphitheater, which sourced the electron mud flow. Here's what it looks like from the ground. According to Dick Iverson, there's still enough material up here to do it again. This is what a 250, 300 million cubic meter lahar looks like. This was the November 2008 uh, lahar off of uh, Huila in, in Colombia down the, down the Rio Paes. This would have reached orting in 50 to 60 minutes, given its velocity. Here are school children practicing an evacuation from their school in orting on a bridge across the Puyallup River. They're heading for the safety, safety of the elevated areas on the south of town. And it takes them about 45 minutes to walk from school to these uh, safe areas. They practice this every year. So we put this automated Lahar detection system in on Mount Rainier in 1998, uh, specifically for, for giving um, uh, ording enough time to evacuate. And we estimated that we could provide them somewhere between 40 and 50 minutes uh, before, before a lahar would, would hit that, that bridge. Uh, we're replacing that system, which had been based on AFMs, with broadbands. Now the, the new detection algorithm is the same as the one that we implemented in 1998. Instead of AFMs, we're using RSAM from the broadbands to detect a lahar and tripwires to determine if the lahar might be big enough to reach ording. And for that, we're using the standard lahar z constitutive equations that relate lahar volume with planimetric area with cross sectional area, which we can measure with a tripwire. Here are some Lahar Z runs down the Rio Puyallup to the south and the Carbon River to the north. They, this is the town of Ording here. The pink zone is a 250 million cubic meter Lahar, which represents the extent of a, an electron sized Lahar. And the red is a 40 million cubic meter Lahar, which is about the size of the smallest Lahar, which would reach Ording. Now we'll look at our sensor array down here. So here's our sensor array. We have five stations. 
two of them are high and above the levels of, of uh, any anticipated lahars. Three of them are dead men tripwires, which are just within the reach of a 40 million cubic meter lahar. So in our automated detection system, we have the following schema. Four of the five stations must be operational. All of the operational stations must register constant seismicity during this period of detection. And all of the operational dead men stations or tripwires must either break a tripwire or stop transmitting. So this is our standard configuration. We have a box. We have a seismometer where we used to have an AFM. And we have a cable down here wrapped around a tree for our tripwire. And the tree is just below the level of a 40 million cubic meter lahar. This is a Puyallup River represented down here at the bottom of the valley. So replacing the system. Lahar detection now is a priority at CVO. This is, uh, uh, we're doing this with funding following a, a tragic landslide in the north of the state here several years ago. So CVO has a, has a, has a powerful team of size, seismologists and engineers working on this. We've got Wes Thalen and Kate Alstead, who are leading the scientific development along seismic and infrasonic lines. Rebecca Kramer, who's leading the field engineering effort. Ben Pauk, who's doing all the admin wrangling. And Chris Lockett, Lockett who's reading, leading the programming. Uh, you folks will remember Chris Lockett from, I think it was 2016 or 2018 when we were down there. Seth Moran and I are also involved. So this is Rebecca standing here. This is the station design that she, she produced for the, for the Lahar stations. And this is the network. Now there have been many people working on the network design, um, but Rebecca is, is heading up the effort. We've got Mount Rainier here. The existing stations from the uh, regional network are shown in yellow. There are a few of them. The proposed stations are in red. Those are mostly within Rainier National Park and require an extensive permitting process. And the blue stations are stations that have already been installed as part of the upgrade of the uh, Lahar detection system. These are our current tripwire stations. They are at the same locations basically as the tripwire stations from the 1998 system because that's as far upstream as we can get them and still, uh, still have the system function. We have taken the higher stations and moved them further upstream so that they can perhaps get an earlier detection of the, of the, uh, of the Lahar. So here's Chris Lockett. Many of you will recognize him. He's in charge of the Lahar detection software design, the uh, associated IT system design, and he's a competent field hand. This is uh, one of the screens from the OPC um, configuration software. A few of you will recognize this. This is the tool that uh, Chris is using to replace the 1998 software. It is similar to what, what you have at uh, Code Epoxy, the OP, OPC system that you have down there. Now he's also working on a simple and self-explanatory interface for the emergency managers at Pierce County in the state of Washington, as well as real-time messaging and an interface for a USGS duty officer. And once he's done with the uh, upgrade of the, of the, uh, of the uh, Lahar detect automated Lahar detection system, he's going to turn his efforts to working on a more generalized detection and Lahar packet or alarming package that will be based on, based on earthworm and not OPC. So this is Wes Thalen down here. He's a seismologist. He's been working on, among other things, seismic amplitude source locations. Um, this is some work that he did from a, uh, uh, locating a, a small debris flow that we had at Rainier last year. One of the advantages of doing this work at Rainier is that there are a large number of uh, debris flows and, and small you know, melt events almost on an annual basis that can be used to help 
develop these techniques with the instrumentation that we have in, in, installed and show us where we might need to improve the, uh, the, the, the network or, or our techniques. So here, he's got a uh, uh, sort of an RSAM graph of one of, the, one of the nearby stations, and he's divided the hour-long flow up into five different phases and then located events from each of those phases on the side of the volcano. So the star here indicates where the lahar actually occurred. These three little red triangles are the stations, and the, uh, and the colored balloons are the, are the locations from early to late within each phase. He's constrained these locations to lie along known stream valleys, and ideally you would like to see these traversing from high on the volcano to a lower air, to, to lower on the volcano, and you would like to see them to start where the, where the actual lahar was. And you can see that he's been successful in, in, in limiting them to the quadrant of the volcano that we are interested in knowing where, where, where things are coming down. So, so it's successful in telling us that things are coming down the Puyallup Nisqually. But you could see that if there were more stations here, he'd be, he'd be getting a better uh, 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 set of locations on these, on these ASL, uh, using this ASL technique but it's pretty promising. With the same debris flow, he, he analyzed the infrasound taken from a three element array located down here. Um, this is where that, uh, that lahar was, uh, was located. Um, and these are the back azimuths, where the back azimuths intersect streams of different, uh, different events within, within this, uh, infrasound event. This is the iPensive display of the infrasound event. Uh, you can see the uh, you can see the lahar, the debris flow occurring in this part of the part of the uh, uh, part of the graphic. This is a 10 minute long uh, period and so this is the the, the lahar is basically uh, best represented here. This is probably an aircraft. It doesn't have anything to do with the lahar. You can see the back azimuths <laughs> come from 90 degrees back, uh, back into. But you can see that it's a complicated problem. Um, with one array, you're not really able to get much of a fix on, on, this, uh, uh, on this lahar, even though you can detect it. So there is clearly more work to be done here. Uh, the other thing that Wes is working on is designing a decision matrix to help a duty scientist to quickly identify whether information is, or whether, whether a lahar is happening or whether the information is, is providing a false alarm. This is Kate Alstead. She's also a seismologist. Here she is using a hammer to, as a signal source to generate empirical greens functions for a beam forming experiment, which she's doing at the USGS flume. This is a map of the flume. It's about 100 and 120 meters long. These circles indicate two seismic arrays that she has placed here. And I want you to remember these for the, for the subsequent slide. This is array C and this is array B. So here is the same flume. We're gonna run a video of this here in a minute. And the experiment is running eight cubic meters of sand and gravel and cobbles down this flume. These are those two arrays. This is the C array, which is off to this side, and the B array, which is off to this side. Now the C array is sensitive at a fairly high frequency level, the B array at a lower frequency level. In each of these graphs, the horizontal axis is time from zero out to 20 seconds, and the vertical axis is distance of the material down the flume. So here, I want to explain these lines. This heavy line is the flow front. This red line is the center of mass of the flow. The little green line is saltating material in front of the flow front. And these dots are where the beam forming um, algorithm places, places the event. Similarly here for, for the B array. So what we find, what she finds, is that there is a blind zone 
for the B array for uh, for the for the distance below below about fifty meters, but the C array tracks the uh, tracks the flow fairly well. Uh, this is an event where the a point where the where the flow stalls. This is where the surge overtakes the front, and beyond that is a chain of surges. Now I want you to watch here. We're going to run a video, and this red arrow is going to indicate these points where the C array is, is uh, the, 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 the beam forming from the C array is detecting events. And the yellow is where the B array is detecting these events. Now, here we go. Uh, that black dot is the front of the flow and the red dot is the center of mass. The time, time of the flow is, is shown up here. So you can see that this C array with the higher frequencies is tracking the flow much better than the B array. And now we've gotten up into a point where the flow has basically happened and they're just pointing at, pointing at noise. The other thing that she's looking at is the response of tilt meters to flows. We installed a couple of tilt meters along the side of the flume for, as an experiment. And she, uh, she noted that there is a tilt response to the, to the passage of, of, a, of a bulk of material. Uh, she and a student are currently evaluating these, these data. So this is Ben Pauk. He is in charge of making everything go. He's doing the permitting and admin uh, work, the budgeting, the field planning, logistics, helicopter management, and he's also a competent field hand. Here he is on snowshoes on the top of Mount St. Helens. The other thing that's going on here that isn't uh, isn't directly uh, associated with with the uh, uh, with the with the Rainier project is the development of the DCLAW software by David George and Dick Iverson. Dick just retired from CBO, so DCLAW provides a useful tool for seamlessly integrating a simulation of debris avalanches and lahars from the initial uh, initial event down to deposition. So in addition to, uh, to all CVO's work, VDAP has, has been doing, doing some work and we've been doing some lahar monitoring in, in, in uh, Guatemala at Fuego following the, uh, the June 3rd, 1918, or 2018, <laughs> 2018 event. This is a video of a lahar coming down the Rio Sinesis that was taken by, by, by Rowdy. So I want you to notice this water pipe that has bro been broken here by the lahar. Here it is. Uh, they are, they're dredging it out uh, for the next lahar. So this water pipe is three or maybe four meters above the uh, level of the level of the stream here. So we're looking, we're looking at, at lahars here that are three to four meters deep. One of the things that we that we found working at, uh, at Fuego with these lahars is that the S-grams give a really good uh, instant indicator that, that a lahar is occurring. And without even pointing at it, you can see that there are three lahars represented in this day-long S-gram. We're gonna look at this lower one. This is what it looks like on, on Swarm. You can see the seismic, uh, seismic signal associated with this lahar and the spectra that, uh, that Swarm shows. This is a webcam that we have located at this, at this site. This is a Rio Sinesis. It's raining hard, so it looks a little fuzzy. This is at uh, 1420, at about this point in the, in the seismic trace. 10 minutes later at 1430, you can see there's a lahar occupying the valley. The front of the lahar has already passed, and now we are at the point of uh, pretty close to the maximum uh, seismicity from this uh, from this flowage event. However, we have a six element array uh, array of uh, infrasound co-located with this, and it sees nothing. Um, this was predicted by Mario Ruiz last year when uh, when I was in in Ecuador. Um, so clearly, there is more work to be done. 
Um, um, Wes's work on Rainier is, is encouraging, but that is where we are today. Thank you very much. <laughs>